Sixty years ago, in 1942, North Essex saw its first arrivals of American airmen to take part in the Second World War. Airfields were constructed at Earl's Cone, Wormingford, and the famous fighter base at Boxted, just outside of Colchester. It was Boxted that the CHTV cameras visited for a highly successful open day. From Boxted, we head up the old A604 to the American Military Cemetery just outside of Cambridge to join the annual Memorial Day service. Our 2002 Remembrance Day program fittingly ends with modern day American airmen from RAF Lakenheath in the Missing Man Formation. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mr Roger Freeman who's going to give us a few words of his memories of the airfield and a couple of funny stories. So a nice big hand for Roger please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you should learn never to applaud before the event. You may regret it. Well, when I was a boy, the old boys on my father's farm were always talking about their youth and giving us their memories. And to be quite honest, their nostalgia really didn't interest me. It was a different world. So I've always been very wary of going into nostalgia with people of younger generations. So, quite honestly, I wouldn't want to stand here and spin all those memories that I have of those long gone days when this plot of land up the road here was an airfield, Langham Drone as we boys called it because at the time we didn't know there was another Langham airfield in existence in North Norfolk and that the official name of this place was Boxted. My memories are many. I remember the day in July 1943 when a fortress bomber returned from a raid and you could literally see the sunlight through the holes in the wings and the tails and there were wounded on board. And we boys watched the ambulances take the wounded away. There was another occasion of an aircraft crash landing just behind the Shepparton Dog. It came across the road and the nose of the aircraft ended up in the garden of a little cottage up the road there. And when we boys got there, the lady of the house came out and she spoke to the pilot who was unhurt but somewhat shaken and said, my son flies thunderbolts in Burma. I've often wanted to see one, but I didn't think I'd get to see one so closely. But what can I tell you? Most of you have your own memories who were around in those times. So let me finish on two tales. First of all, I remember a time when, with my father, who had a, a beat up old Talbot saloon car, we drove round the perimeter track of the airfield to look at some hay that had been made on the airfield. And when we looked at the hay, which was just the other side of the hedge, opposite Thorpe the Butcher's shop, in those days there was a hedge there, not houses. And as we'd finished and prepared to drive off, through the hedge came a very large and somewhat portly American sergeant holding a yellow rose in his hand. And he said to my father, Pop, are you going back across the base there near the camp? Can you give me a lift? So my father said, yes, I'd be delighted to. And at that moment, he turned, the, the American did, and looked back through the gap in the hedge through which he'd come and said, come on, fellas, we got a trip back to the base. And through the hedge, by my counting, came 11 other Americans. And although my father protested mildly that there wasn't room for that number, they were intent on getting a free ride home. The back seat of the vehicle usually took three people sitting down, but I'm sure there must have been seven or eight in there. There were two on the running boards, and the portly sergeant had the passenger front seat to himself, with me sitting on his lap. And all the way back, the mile round the perimeter track to the main gate, he kept jabbing this yellow flower under my nose, my father's nose, and his own nose, and repeating time and time again, gee, don't this smell good. 
The lady at the Fox Pub gave me this flower. Gee, it's a beautiful English rose. I shall keep this. But the odour actually that filled the car was the beery smell of these people. When we got to the main gate and all these guys unloaded and the poor car stopped creaking, they started to ask my father if he wanted any recompense. And he said, no, no, please to give you a lift. Although I'm sure he wondered about the safety of his vehicle. And then they started to throw coins in through the open window. And my father protested, but they continued to do this. And I collected up the pricely sum of three pounds, five pence. And to a boy who that, at that time was earning two and six for a week's labor, that was a hell of a lot of money. But my father, although he protested that he didn't want to be recompensed, immediately said, boy, that's too much money for you and took it. So I'm never likely to forget that occasion. And finally, let me tell you of an occasion when the previous spring, with a friend about the same age, we were standing on the Boxted Road, looking over the hedge at a thunderbolt being serviced. And there were several fellows around it, and suddenly one walked across towards us. And we thought we were going to be told off for loitering and looking at a military installation. But it turned out to be the pilot of the Thunderbolt. His name was Richard Heineman. And he said, hey boys, would you like to come close and look at a P-47? And we were through that hedge like grease lightning. And he took us across to the aircraft and we were shown around it. And then he addressed us. He said, any of you boys got any sisters? Now my friend had three of the right age. And all I had was a younger brother. And the pilot's attention was then turned to my friend with the three sisters, and my friend was lifted up and put in the cockpit of the Thunderbolt, while I was left on the ground. And I can tell you, if I could have done a, a quick sex change on my younger brother, I would have done it. But there's a sad end to this tale, because a few days later, that Thunderbolt was no longer on its dispersal point. And it wasn't until later years that I found out that soon after the event I've just related, Richard Heinemann was shot down in a dogfight. Probably he ended up as a victory symbol on some Luftwaffe fighter pilot's aircraft. But that was war. But to finish, just let, re re let me remind you that Boxted Airfield was a very famous airfield and still is a very famous airfield because the three units that were based here were quite distinguished. The Marauder outfit that was here initially was given a citation for its, its performance during its time here. The very first Mustang fighters, the famed Mustangs, were based here at the end of 1943 through to April, the following April. And that unit, the 364th Fighter Group, was very successful and one of its squadrons shot down more enemy aircraft than any other American squadron during the Second World War. When the Mustangs left to go to France, the red-nosed Thunderbolts of the 56th Fighter Group arrived. And that group was the most distinguished and successful fighter group flying in Europe, shot down more enemy aircraft than any other outfit based in England. And it, of course, it had the two top fighter aces, Francis Grabreski and Bob Johnson, who shot down more enemy aircraft than any other American fighter pilots. And also, we mustn't forget that the only Congressional Medal of Honor, the American VC, won by a fighter pilot flying in Europe in the Second World War, was won by Jim Howard flying from this airfield on the 11th of January, 1944. Indeed, it was a very famous airfield, and we shouldn't remember, forget the RAF boys who were here for a while after the war. And with that, let me say I have much pleasure in opening this show. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Well, sitting on Daisy May is Pat Morris from Frinton, Pat. From Walton on the Nays, actually, Kirby Road. So it's just next door, and we've got yes. quite a lot of our viewers in homes down in the Frinton area so welcome to CHTV today 
You're sitting on Daisy May, that yeah. you and your husband have brought along here to Boxter today. Why? Well, we brought Daisy May here today because she's an air base chief, 1942. Um, and she's actually designated for another local airfield, Ridgewell, but there aren't that many airbase designated jeeps around and we support this airfield as well, so we brought along here today. But um, we have two other jeeps and I suppose you could say we're quite into military vehicles generally. What actually started, if you've got three jeeps, what actually started you off on the track of, of jeeps? Uh, dinky toys. Uh, my husband always collected military dinky toys um, from the age of about 11 and he decided a few years ago that he'd like something full scale. So he went and bought his first Jeep and uh, he's bought one every February since then. February's Jeep month. <laughs> so what, is it number four coming around in next year then? He says not, but he has got his eye on the Dodge Ambulance. <laughs> Have you, have you got somewhere big that you can keep them all? Well, we're very fortunate in that uh, we have a, a very kind and helpful local farmer, David Eagle, who lets us store the jeeps in a, a disused outbuilding at one of his farms. So we're very grateful to David. And if I work it out right, you've had them about three years now then? The first one, this, this one, Daisy May, uh, we acquired her this year. So that's her first season. And uh, she's a lovely jeep. Um, she was in excellent order. Virtually all we had to do with her was to paint her and put on her livery. Hardly any mechanical work had to be done there at all because after the war she went back to California and she didn't come back to the UK until 1993. And do you get out most weekends with her then? From about the uh, middle of April until round about now we're out every weekend with one of them and we try to rotate them uh, to be fair to them all. <laughs> I'll ask a really difficult question. Jeeps, from my knowledge, from in, in the past, I've heard that they drink up the gas quite, quite a lot. Is that true? Well, by comparison with a motor car, yes. Yes, it is true. But if you're, having, if you're driving a military vehicle, they are probably the best to drive. Uh, she does about 18 to the gallon. Our French Jeep does about 24, which is pretty good. Equip so you take the French one to long trips, do you? <laughs> um, no, no, no. We, we just have to bite the bullet and, you know, as we rotate them. We decide at the beginning of the year which Jeep is going where. And this one is obviously more suitable to events in this area. Yeah. So uh, that's how we decide. And we usually take our... Um, New our 1950s, I beg your pardon, American Jeep, the further distance is because uh, she's a more powerful vehicle and a bit more comfortable. And just one final question. There must be lots and lots of Jeeps still around in all over the, the place. Mm. Is getting spares for them difficult? Getting spares is very easy. There's, um, I think there's about four or five specialists in this country and there's many others on the continent. And as you say, there are still a lot of Jeeps around, but most of them are now privately owned and they're getting harder and harder to, to buy unless somebody who's got one feels like selling them and they're getting more and more expensive. So how much of the old airfield actually still exists? Yeah, several buildings still over there, several Nissan huts, several ancillary buildings on an industrial estate. The most important buildings that are left is the operations block, which was the nerve centre of the airfield. That's still completely intact. We also have the pre-gunnery trainer, which looks like a very large blister hanger. That's still complete. And there's several other ancillary buildings around. So any thought in future years that you might be able to put one of those buildings to use and have a museum on Boxted in there? That would be my ultimate aim. My, my personal ambition would be to have a museum on the site, yeah. Um, hopefully today we might you know, succeed in raising funds where we could perhaps uh, we've had start the wheels in motion in that respect.
The one aircraft leaving the formation symbolizes comrades who did not return from battle. Military personnel in uniform will render a hand salute at the sounding of taps. After taps, please be prepared for the sound of the F-15 flyby, which will approach from the left of this memorial after a short delay. Following the benediction today, there will be a flyby of the B-17 from the Imperial War Museum at Duck Street. Ready.